Okay, uh, welcome everyone. In today's lecture, we'll look into aspects of robot control. So this means uh, at different levels of our autonomous robot, there are different kinds of controls needed. So at the trajectory level, we need to ensure that we are following the trajectory. At the position level, we need to ensure that we reach the point on the trajectory that we want. And even at a motor level, we need certain controls. And uh, we look at all these aspects at these different levels. Uh, what we'll also look into is the popular a controller called as the PID control, which is proportional, integrative, and derivative control. So this is a concept coming from the feedback control kind of uh, controllers, and we'll see how we can use these uh, PID control for realizing uh, the task of driving our robot along the desired trajectory. And finally, we'll also see some more advanced methods which are out there, uh, which can give us some specific performance if you're looking for them. For example, if we want our system to be robust, to let's say noise in our measurements, to noise in our state estimation and so on, we would need some specific uh, kind of algorithms. Uh, if we want it to be fail safe, so for example, some part fails and we want it still to work, we'll also look at these kind of uh, algorithms later on towards the end of the lecture. So before I get started, I just want to show you a rough control architecture that, that one sees uh, uh, when you have an autonomous robot in question. So what you see here in the gray box here you could say this is the thinking part or the representation that the robot has of the world. And uh, what we've seen in the other lectures are techniques, for example, to create a map of the environment using a sensor. So this could be a laser scanner and you go around your room and create a map. So this is one aspect of, let's say, the representation of the world. And then you have the modules doing localizations. So given this map, can we figure out where we are using then again some other sensors, in, for example, like a laser scanner or a GPS, etc. So all this forms, so these parts we have seen in the other lecture and these, uh, so to say, form the representation of the robot. And the way the robot usually interacts with the world, so the world here, is usually through the actuators. So if you have a mobile robot, these actuators could be wheels, so you have some motors attached to the wheels, which cause the movement and allow your platform to move in the environment. Whereas on the other end, if you want to perceive how you actually move, you equip your, uh, your robot with some kind of sensors. So this could be wheel encoders, this could be GPS uh, devices, laser scanners, uh, whatever. So you have a representation of the world and yourself, so the thing in the gray box here. Then you have a way to actually move in the physical world using your actuators, so the motors, and you have a way to actually sense what you act uh, what movement that you actually made. And using these uh, three structures here, or three ideas, uh, you can control the robot to go along a particular trajectory, for example. And the task that we will be specifically focusing in this uh, lecture is what sits on this side of this uh, graph here. So what we will look is three levels of control. At the lowest level, we'll first see how to actually control the motor itself. So if we want the motor to rotate at a particular speed, so in this case, let's say we talk about an uh, autonomous car. Uh, this would mean that you would need to control the speed that you move at, and this would in turn mean that you would need to control the motors uh, that you have. Then one level up would be to do some kind of a position control. This means that you want to reach a particular position in the environment. Right? So there's some task you need to complete, and for this you need to go to a particular position and we have some control at this level. And then finally, the higher level control uh, would be a trajectory level control. So uh, think of a situation where you have a map and you have to go from your current position to a particular position, a destination position. And this would be, let's say your planning algorithm gives this plan. Then from this plan, you can generate some trajectories. So how to actually reach this uh, position in a smooth manner. And once you have that, so how do you actually link all these three levels of control to achieve your task? And primarily, we will look at these three uh, tasks today, and we'll always give the example of uh, a, a mobile robot, um, say an autonomous car in, in an urban environment, but the idea kind of remains the same, whether if it's a drone, a flying robot, or whether it's a humanoid. So this structure usually remains the same. And sometimes in the literature, you would find that this structure is also called as the think, act, and sense paradigm. So this is the thinking part, this is the acting part, and this is the uh, sensing part. 
So this was a motivation for where really the control fits in the overall autonomous system architecture, so to say, and to motivate why we really need to solve this task. So let's start at the lowest level, so at the level of the motor control, right? Uh, and for this, I give a really simple example, the example of a DC motor. So I guess most of you probably have seen this kind of motor in your school or probably you, you even have built one. Uh, the idea of example here is quite simple. So you have two uh, magnets, uh, the, shown here by the north and the south pole. And uh, the main idea here is when you have some uh, uh, electricity, some current flowing through a magnetic field, this particular wire which carries your current will experience some force. And that exactly happens here. So this is uh, the diagram for a simple DC motor. So what you see here in gold here is basically some brushes which then connect to a coil which is going inside your magnetic field. And then what one does is to connect these uh, wires to a battery. Then we complete the circuit and there is a current flowing through the, the coil. Uh, as we have the, the permanent magnets here, so we have a north and a, so, uh, a south pole, so we have some magnetic field in this direction and we have an electric field in the perpendicular direction. What this then does is to create a force on this shaft moving it 180 degrees. So this way we have converted our electrical energy, so from the battery power, into mechanical energy of rotation. So you could also think of a motor as a transducer which converts one kind of energy into another kind of energy. So I go, I give just these details to, to, uh, to tell you that the, when we design a controller, it really goes down to quite a low level of understanding how the actuators work themselves. And in this case, it's a simple DC motor. Okay, so now we have the actuator, which is basically a DC motor. The next question in terms of control is, how can I control this? So for example, for a motor, I would like it to uh, move at a certain speed. So I would like to rotate it, let's say 50 times per second if, you, if I want to go at a particular speed, then I would like to go at 100 rotations per second if I want to go faster. And the question is how can I actually control this? And for the DC motor, this happens to be quite straightforward. So uh, for the DC motor, essentially the idea is the more power you give, the more electricity you put in, the faster the thing would rotate. So the, the force on the, on, the, on the coil here is directly proportional to the current that it's carrying. And therefore, uh, one way to actually do it is what is also called as pulse width modulation. So what you see here is a pulse. And here, for example, if, uh, and usually the zero uh, volt is called the off state and the five volt is the on state. And at the extreme, if we keep it on for the entire duration of the pulse, this could correspond to the maximum speed at which the motor can rotate. And therefore to control the motor, so if you want to go, to go at just, let's say one fourth the speed, we would keep this signal on only for one fourth of the time. So there's a direct proportionality between the duty cycle, so the amount of time for which your, uh, your current is on or the power is on, versus the overall, uh, overall period of the, uh, of the signal. So this way of uh, control is called as pulse width modulation is, is one of the most popular ways to control the, uh, the DC motor. And basically you can buy chips like these, uh, which actually do this for you. So in this case, actually there are four of these controllers. So you can control four such motors using a chip like this. So this is uh, all the hobby robotics or even most of the professional ones would have some board like this, which would then control the speed at which you can rotate the motors, right? So in an ideal world, if our motors were perfect, if what we ask it to perform, it does, then we are done. So we don't need any more, uh, uh, any more theory, so to say. But in practice, what we see is that such open loop controls in the sense what I just said. So you ask the robot to, or the motor to, let's say rotate at 50 uh, revolutions per second, 50 rotations per second. It might give you just 48 or it might give you 52 because the, the, some things are not calibrated well, maybe you don't have a direct uh, relationship between the, the current that you give to the rotations that you give, which is perfect. So there's some things which are imperfect there. And this kind of control is also called as an open loop control in the sense that you give a command, the controller executes it, and you have no knowledge what happens. So here comes this idea of a feedback control. So usually most systems, what they do is that you have the controller, 
to which you give the desired value. So in this case, this desired value could be the number of rotations per minute. So say you want 50 rotations per minute, then you give your control, you ask this guy to produce certain electricity, it does this and then moves the system. So once you move the system, then you can observe this movement through a sensor. So in case of a motor, this is usually an encoder. You can attach to the shaft of the motor some kind of an encoder and this tells you how many revolutions that you actually made. Right? So now for example, like I said before, you observe that you have only made 48 revolutions. Then you can take this different signal between what you want and between what you actually observe. So let's say 50 minus 48, which is two. So you're missing two more uh, uh, rotations per minute. And then this signal, the controller should be smart enough such that it takes this error signal, so this two revolutions per minute signal, and then generate more power, so to say, to compensate for the fact that you're not moving as fast as you, th as you think. So in general, this kind of scheme is called as a feedback control where you, where you also sense actually what, uh, what this is how, how the system is evolving and use this information to recompute your controls. So in a way, this is the, a smarter way than let's say a, 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 an open loop controller where you can have much more noise. Right. And actually this idea is not something new. And this, this problem is something which we solve every day in our shower in the morning. So if you think of this feedback example, so let's say I like to have my shower at 35 degrees. Uh, and when I enter the shower, the water is at 30 degrees, right? Uh, this is in it, so to say 35 is my desired state, 30 is my current, 30 degrees is my current uh, state of the water. Then the control that I have for the shower is this knob here. So you can move it left or right, you can rotate it left or right. And then this adds, let's say more cold water or more hot water to actually change the, the water temperature, right? Then you stand under the shower and then in this case you feel the water fall on you and then you could say your skin, so to say, is the sensor which tells you, okay, is this warm enough? Is this too hot? Is this too cold? And then you use this information, so what your skin tells you or what your body tells you, and then you, uh, you say, okay, you have an idea of, uh, of, okay, now the water seems to be 32 instead of 30 and it's still not 35, so I still need to move the liver more to the left because left here, let's say, adds more hot water. So this is a problem that we solve every day and it's the same with the, uh, with the robot control as well. So we want the signal to reach or we want the system to reach a particular state and we keep observing what the state is or at least what the measurable part of the state is and use it to drive our system. So if you want to see kind of the same system more mathematically, uh, this is what we show here. So the controller, is usually defined as a function of your error function. Uh, so you have your error signal. So uh, the input to the controller is an error signal, which is basically the desired value for your state minus what you actually measure. So if your desired value is X des and what you measure is ZT, it's a difference of this. So technically, it might also happen that this, uh, the, uh, the value that you measure may not be the entire state. So if we take off a 2D robot, for example, uh, let's say your 2D robot has, um, the state is defined by your X, Y position and the orientation. However, you have a sensor, say like the GPS sensor, which only gives you the position and no uh, orientation information. This means that your sensor cannot observe the orientation of the robot. So no matter what orientation it is in, you don't really see it. Uh, in our examples, we'll see a simple case where we, where we say that we observe all the states. However, in practice, uh, this is something we should remember that not all the states that you want to track may be observable. Right. So we saw the controller. So the goal of this lecture is actually to design this guy such that given an error signal, it pro produces a UT, which is a control to your system. So this could be how fast your motor moves, uh, or go to a certain position in the environment and uh, along the trajectory and so on. And then we have a system definition uh, typically, we have a model of how the system evolves. So in this case, for example, usually we model them in a linear way. So the system at time t depends on what the system state or what the state is at time t minus one plus some controls that you give to it. So this is a very simple, simplified uh, uh, formula here. In principle, you could have 
more nonlinear functions which which map your current state to the future state. In this case, let's say this works well for the shower case where you say the current temperature of the water is the previous temperature plus the amount of let's say the new hot water that you add in. And so for such a system, this is good enough, but for many uh, mobile robotic systems, we'll see that we'll need something more complicated, right? And uh, it might all, what we should also consider that this system, we don't always know perfectly. So it's our assumption how this system works. So they, they, there's some simplifications we make just for modeling purposes. And this also causes some error in, uh, in, in our estimation problem. So in the sense that we predict our system to be in a particular place, but this might not be the case because our model is too simplistic. So this is a rough block diagram for all the problems that we'll see. Essentially, they are of this kind uh, today. And let's say we want to design the simplest controller. So what would be one of the simplest controller that we could design? Say this, let's say we start with what is called as the proportional control, in which the idea is just that your, uh, your control law, so UT, is just uh, a, a proportion, so it's a constant times your error signal. So what this says is that if your error is high, give a high input. If your error is low, give a lower input, multiplied by some, uh, some constant. So uh, do I want to take map directly the whole error as, uh, as the control, or do I want to do, let's say, 10% of it? So I could have k as 0.1, then this would mean take the error and just apply 0.1 of it and so on. So let's see, uh, basically let's see the example for the shower and see how this proportional control would work in different cases that could happen in, in reality. So this is the most ideal case. Here we take a KP as one. So essentially our control law UT is nothing but one times the error, uh, error function. So what you will see here uh, uh, in, also in the upcoming slides are basically two measurements, one uh, on the on the top here is the temperature. So this is the actual state of the water or the temperature of the water that you're taking the shower in. And on the bottom, you see the control. So this control here, we say this is basically the number of degrees. So the number of uh, degrees in terms of temperature and not in terms of angles. So uh, let's say we map our handle. So let's say if we move it like halfway around, this, uh, this represents whatever, five degrees uh, more heat, adding more f uh, heat to the water. And if we move it completely, it would be 10 degrees and something like this. So we start at time t equal to zero. Uh, water here, yeah, here it shows 25 degrees. And we want to reach a desired position of uh, 35 degrees. Right. Uh, then what we do is we apply this control law. So it says u is k times et and k is one. So the error is basically 10 degrees, we are at 25, we want to be at 35, the error is 10, and therefore our control would be apply 10 degrees more heat to the water. And this is what we see, so in one second, we apply 10 degrees, we reach our desired uh, temperature. So here in the Z, you see what we actually observe. In this case, let's say we are able to observe the temperature, which means this blue line is what we actually observe using our sensor. Whereas the red is actually the true temperature itself. In practice, we wouldn't know this. So this is, a, this is some state internal to the world and we can only estimate it, we don't know it. But in these graphs that you would see, we assume, this to know, uh, we assume to know this just to compare our measurements to what the actual state is. In this perfect ideal case, no noise, nothing, this is perfect. You apply one control, you reach the state you want and it's done. But you know from your experience in the shower that this is never the case. You can't just move your handle once and you're happy with the water, right? Why is this? So one of the things is that there's certain amount of noise in the system. You think that moving the handle by a certain, um, a certain amount should increase the water uh, temperature by a certain amount, but there's always some noise. So maybe there's some noise in the way the water is being mixed. Maybe there's some delay in uh, in the time between uh, when you actually mix it and when it happens. So one of these uh, um, uh, effects is the noise part. And then maybe also it depends on your sensor. So maybe you actually detect that the water is hotter or colder a bit later, or you also detect it with some error. So to, so to say what I want to um, convey here that you can have system or measurement errors. So you can have errors in your, 
in your model of uh, how the thing works or you could also have some errors in your sensors and these are the two kinds of errors that you need to take care of and let's see what happens for example in the same case like before but now we have uh, say noise in our measurements uh, in this case so it could have been also in the system but we just show here on the measurements so basically this blue line here you see here has some noise and what does this do then so for example you start again at zero you want to go to 35 and then you apply certain amount of different uh, certain uh, control but then you cross this 35 because let's say your sensor has some error and you didn't actually detect it to be 35 and at each time basically since there is some error in your in your measurement here you would never actually reach the 35 but always be a little bit up or down and you will always try to uh, to make this correction and what this would mean in terms of the control would mean that you would keep moving your handle or you would keep controlling to actually get the nice temperature that you want and this is not something that you would like in a shower you want to quickly adjust the water and then enjoy the shower and not really move your handle the whole time that you are standing there All right so one of the ways to actually deal with this noise so if you have noise in your system so which is almost all the times in a real world system is to actually play around with the gain kp and so the things that we have in our hand or the parameters that are there is uh, ideally we would like to reach to our desired position as fast as we can and once we reach there we should we don't want to give any more extra controls but it's not an ideal world and one of the ways to actually uh, trade off between these two things is by setting different gains and in particular a lower gain helps in case of uh, in case there is some noise so for example again here the blue line shows the noisy measurements of the temperature however if we now apply only 15 percent of that error the error in terms or the, the amount of change that we will do to the system is also 15 times lower and therefore our state red here won't go up and down as much as we saw before so now the state moves much more smoothly the trade-off of course here is that now you require whatever let's say 25 seconds to reach roughly your temperature versus you reach your temperature roughly i don't know in a couple of seconds so there's a trade-off between how much control you need to give and the time you uh, require to reach this particular state and often this depends on our application so for example in this case maybe it's okay if you still have to wait for 20 seconds for the water to be at the temperature that we want and um, we are happy with a lower gain uh, to do this of course it depends on the application sometimes you want the system to uh, arrive very quickly then you would need something more right. and uh, we can see the opposite end so what would happen if we uh, have gains which are more than one and this is definitely uh, one should definitely avoid this in most real cases uh, this is because if you have a gain which is more than one you would always kind of magnify the error that's there in the system so if you have a certain error in measurement which is um, say few degrees or five degrees and then every time you multiply this error by two and you could end up in an unstable system where in this case you would probably burn with your water reaching at 100 degrees so it's usually recommended not to use a gain which is more than one especially in systems that's affected by noise right and what you should also not do is to apply the error in the negative uh, or in the opposite direction so in some of the programming assignments before we have seen if you let's say uh, if you flip the sign of the error then you would end up in situations which you don't want to for example in this case it's 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 a simulated case or it's a theoretical case so to say so here what you do is that you want you are at whatever 25 you want to go to 35 however instead of applying a correction of 10 you apply a correction of minus 10 so you're always going away from the uh, from the desired position and what i just show here is basically at some point there is a limit to your system so this is defined by the physics of the uh, of the world itself so in this case for example you can't go below let's say minus 272 which is the absolute zero right so the message here to is to say that there is a limit on the system which is defined by the physics so you can't drive your system to whatever uh, uh, position that you desire there is some certain limits that exist due to the environment in which you work and there are also certain limits 
uh, which come from the side of your control. So for example, uh, uh, in the handle case, you can only move your handle so much. So you can't move it infinitely fast or infinitely away, right? So infinitely hot. And this often leads to the situation of what is called saturation. So this means that suppose the maximum your, uh, your heater is able to add, say in a second, is say if say it's five uh, degrees per second, even if your desired temperature, for example, you are at 25, you want to go to 35, since the maximum capacity, the U, the maximum control that you could give is five degrees per second, there is no way that you could reach your desired position immediately. So there will be some delay. And this comes due to the limits on your control. So you have both limits on the system equation, so how the system evolves, but you also have limits on your control uh, based on, on the system as well. And often you would see that we end up in situations of saturation because we don't have enough power, so to say, to, to reach the desired state immediately. Okay, there's another, so this, we have seen what happens in case of noise and the other problem that usually happens in real system are what, uh, uh, what is caused due to delays. So this would mean that I ask to give a particular control, but there is some delay in the system. What happens then? And uh, here we look at a situation in which uh, there's some delay. So again, what we see here, the red one is the true state or the true temperature of the water, whereas the blue one is the measurement. So in this case, we say that the delay exists in the measurement process. So if the water is at whatever, 25, we only detect that it's 25 after a few seconds. So there's a delay in our sensor system. Typically, this delay can happen also in the, in the uh, let's say, in the control process. So when hot water is mixing with the cold one, there could be some delay there. But just for the purposes of this explanation, we say there's some delay in how we measure this. What this then means is that, for example, uh, at this point of time, when the actual temperature of the water has already reached our desired temperature, since our measurements are delayed, we still think that the temperature is 25. However, the actual temperature, uh, temperature of the water is 35 because we have a delay in our measurement system. This means that since to the controller, the controller only knows the error signal which is computed from what it measures. And so the controller still thinks, okay, I need to increase the temperature by 10 more degrees. And so we would still uh, give some control here where we shouldn't have given any. And what this means is that in practice, we actually overshoot the 35 degrees that, the, that we want. And we always uh, end up doing this because we are always kind of behind the actual uh, system. And this results in both overshooting, so we go above the, the, the required temperature, but also we go around our desired temperature because we are always kind of behind, uh, behind the thing. And uh, if to de so when we talk about these delays, there is a term called as dead time, which is often used in the literature. And this dead time, like I said, could come either due to the system so how the system is evolving, or it could also come to the, uh, because of the sensor. But in practice, from the controller point of view, if we sit here, it doesn't really care, or it doesn't, it cannot distinguish between the delay coming from the system or the sensors, because all it sees is the error signal, and it sees, okay, there is some error signal, but it's coming with some delay. So in this case, for example, there's one second delay in the system, half a second delay in the sensor, Basically, for the controller point of view, it's getting a, a view of the state which is one and a half seconds ago rather than now. So you'll often he hear this term of dead time when uh, talking about uh, real systems and when you talk about what are the parameters which your controller should be able to take care of. And in the literature, actually, one of the, the, the standard ways of dealing with this is through what is called as the Smith predictor. Uh, this is an approach to kind of take into account that you have delays in your system and then how to correct it. And the way the Smith predictor works is you have a real system, but then you also have a virtual system or a fake system, which you can use to predict how the system moves. So for example, for now, just consider this lower portion of, uh, of the diagram here. So you have the controller, uh, which controls the UT and gives this UT to the system. Which, which is the real system, so this system has some delay. But you could also think that you give this control to some, uh, some model of your system. So this, is, this doesn't really exist in reality, but it's just an, a mental image of your model, so a model of how your system evolves. 
So what you can do is that since you know that your system has delay, one way to do this is that you just rely on your virtual model and then since the virtual model has no delay, you can just use the output from your virtual model as, your in, uh, as, uh, as the input to your controller. So you are detached to the real world. You just look into your mental image or your model and then you do the control. This is often not good enough because to come up with a delay-free model which is really exact is challenging, especially for real world situations. Let's say this, uh, this geezer or this heater which mixes, it's quite difficult to come up with this. Uh, this exact model. So what usually one does is you still use measurements from your real system. So this is ZT here. You observe your system which has delay. You take some measurements. But then what you also do is you take your virtual measurements that you have and then you pass it through a delay model. And this delay model in the simplest sense could be let's say just an array which stores all your values for the last let's say five seconds. And then what you could do is that you do several empirical analysis and you figure out, okay, on average, my system seems to have a delay of two seconds. Then you look up in this array and you take the value which is two, second, two uh, seconds uh, before, and then you use that value as the correct value because you know or you guess that this is how much the delay is. And then you use that signal to feed back into the controller. So you took both the actual measurements into account and you took an idea of or uh, you took the measurements from your virtual model with some delay estimations that's there. But like I said, so here you need quite good system models and also a good delay model because if the delay model is very bad then uh, then your prediction might not be that uh, better. So this is one of the classical methods that's used to uh, to deal with the delays in the system. And let's see how uh, how this works. Let's say in the perfect in the ideal case, when we have a perfect model of the delay, we know, okay, I have a system delay or a dead time of 1.5 seconds and I have this, uh, this uh, information, then I can perfectly track my desired state. So the red one again is the desired, straight, uh, the desired um, state and the blue one is what I measure. And since I can, co uh, I can perfectly, uh, uh, de so I, I store these values, then I move back in terms of the dead time and I can get a performance like this. Ideally, this is not, I mean, or in practically, this is not the case. So you would either overestimate the delay or underestimate the delay in practice. And this is what we could see. So the case which is kind of a bit bad is the overestimated uh, case. So say the actual dead time is one and a half seconds and you ex or you estimate this dead time to be two seconds. This uh, turns out uh, that you will end up in oscillations like this. This is similar to the case where we saw we are always kind of lagging uh, behind the uh, 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 behind the actual state and this results in these uh, oscillations and you would like to avoid these uh, oscillations in general. So one of the things that's usually recommended is to underestimate the delay. So in the sense that although you are lagging behind the actual measurements, at least you are not uh, or you are not having these kind of oscillations that you had when you overestimated these things. So in, in this case, actually, you're not lagging behind, you are in front of the actual state and you are applying more control than, than that is actually necessary and this results in this oscillation behavior. So the recommendation usually is to underestimate the delay. So if you think that the delay is whatever, two seconds from your measurements, maybe you would like to underestimate a bit. Uh, the the trade-off here is that you would, of course, reach your state a bit later rather than earlier if you had the correct knowledge but at least you're not oscillating. And for many systems, it's more important that you don't, you're stable, so you don't oscillate a lot, but it's okay if you actually reach this state uh, slowly. Right. So basically we have seen a simple, a very simple controller, what is called as the proportional control, and we've seen kind of how it behaves uh, if there is noise, if there is delays, and a couple of kind of hints or, or, or ideas how to deal when you have these situations, which will happen in most real cases. Right? Now we move to one step further on our, our hierarchy of control. So what we saw now, you could say we use this ideas for motors as well. So I, I explained it with the shower example, but the idea is exactly the same with the motors. You want the motors to rotate at a particular uh, rotation speed, and then you'll have all these problems with the noise, with the delay, etc. And all the ideas that we saw will help us uh, get a good control over the motor speed rotation. 
The next task that we'll look up is, uh, is what we call as the position control. Here, uh, we can take the example of an autonomous car, for example, uh, which is shown here. And the goal would be, in this case, to drive this robot to this uh, goal position and uh, reach there and stop there, basically. And um, essentially, the control problem is always the same. So how do I generate the signal U? So what should I tell my car such that it actually reaches this position? And in this case, it stops there. So we just want to reach the goal position and nothing more. Right, so the first thing we need to understand is the kinematics of the of the motion itself. So this is a very simplified version. So we now kind of collapse our whole car as a point mass. This is not a reality, but works quite well for objects or for cars, let's say when they're moving quite slowly. And uh, uh, we have uh, whatever our position and we have a velocity for our, uh, uh, for our robot. And the simplest model is as following. So my new position would be my position at time t minus one plus my velocity times delta t. So whatever the, um, the physics equation we know from our school, right? So uh, s is equals to u plus at. So in this case, actually, there is no acceleration either. So this is just velocity. So no accelerations are considered here. So actually, it's even simpler. So the new state is just the old plus the velocity times the uh, times the delta t. So here uh, for, the, for, for these figures, we'll consider delta t to be one, which means that we'll apply this velocity for one second at each time, just to make the analysis easy. And what we see here is a steady state position. For example, uh, in this case, we start at, let's say x equals to zero. So let's consider a super simple example in 1D. We, uh, we are at x equals to zero and we want to reach x equals to one. And in the no control state, so to say, when we apply zero velocity to our, uh, our car, it will stay there forever. So no surprises here. But we want to do something more, right? So we want to figure out what is the U that we apply at each instant such that we reach this uh, position of one and stay there, right? Uh, let's apply the idea that we saw now, right? So we, we saw how a proportional uh, control works for the motor control case. But uh, would it work for the case of a car? And it so happens that it doesn't. And there's a particular reason for this. So again, what you see here in the red is the true state. So this is the true position of our point mass of a car. And the blue is the, uh, the, in this case, yeah, in this case, the blue would be the derivative. So it's not the estimated one, but rather it's the velocity of the car. So slightly different things than before. So the red is our position and the blue is the velocity of the car because these are the two states which define the motion of the car. Uh, but on the, uh, on the bottom is again controls and uh, I'll explain what these different colors means. For now, this green part is the, uh, uh, the proportional control. So the control basically is computed using your desired position, which is let's say one minus your current position when you start, let's say it's zero. So this is the error signal which you use to compute your proportional control. So this is what the green here shows the proportional control you're giving. But actually what happens here is uh, you want to reach one and you want to stop there. But as you give uh, some control, you, your car reaches the position one, but then due to, the, uh, due to the velocity that it has, so it's not reaching here with a velocity of zero. It's you're, you're keeping adding some velocity and then it, it has some non-zero velocity here. And so it can't come to a stop instantaneously or it doesn't know how to come to a stop instantaneously. So you would overshoot. And then once you would overshoot, then you would detect, okay, I'm farther than where I, I should have been. And then you compute the control in the, um, or you compute the error in the opposite direction now. And then you keep having this oscillatory behavior because you're always reaching your desired position with certain speed, which your proportional control has no knowledge of. So this guy just knows what your current position is and where you want to be, but it has no knowledge of this kinematic, so to say, which tells you at what speed you are in. So the immediate idea would be, okay, then we should have a control which also knows about the velocity. And this is often sometimes called as, or often called as PD control, which means proportional and derivative control. And in the, the derivative part in our example maps to the velocities. Right, so you have the proportional control, which is the difference between your desired state and your current state. And you have a derivative part, which is the difference between your, between your desired velocity. So in our case, we just want to reach 
uh, uh, one, uh, the position one with zero velocity. So the desired velocity in this example is zero, but in uh, typically it could be any desired velocity. And your xt dot is your current velocity, right? So now we have two terms, and when you add these two guys up, it's called a speedy control in the literature. And now, corresponding to each of these terms, you have uh, uh, you have the proportionality constants. And basically, this is what we see here. So when we apply this control, which is given by this equation here, what we see here is that as the uh, as the robot or as the point mass reaches one. We, said the, we see that the velocity also goes down and therefore uh, the, we are able to smoothly reach one and with a velocity of zero. This results in, in our control uh, space, so to say, two signals. One signal coming from the uh, position error and one signal coming from the uh, velocity error. And when we see here, what we show here in green is the combined, um, combined control that we give to the point mass. Whereas in red, we show the proportional error and in this light blue, we show the error due to the derivative terms. So the, com the, the thing that goes to the robot itself is the green part here, but it has two components, one coming from the position error and one coming from the, uh, from the velocity error. So this idea, it's also one of the most common uh, kind of controllers used to, uh, used to move objects to a certain um, state. Right. Uh, again, we can ask the question, what happens if the gains are high? Because we have these two terms, Kp and Kd, which we would need to set. And the question is, uh, what happens if we set them too high? And again, so uh, what we would see is something like this. If we have gains which are too high, we would exceed our, um, our uh, reference uh, positions. Because let's say if the Kp is too high, uh, we make a movement which is too fast and we are not able to stop uh, when we want to and this would read this would give us situation where we would overshoot so ideally when you design control systems these are some terms that you take into account so you want to be to reduce this overshoot value and you want to reduce oscillations in general uh, on the other end if you have too little gain this would mean that you would reach your state too slowly so again there's this a trade-off between how much uh, overshoot your system is able to accept versus how fast your system is able to reach to the desired position. So we could play basically with the KPs and KDs in this sense to obtain a desired uh, um, characteristics for our controller or desired uh, performance for the controller. Right, uh, then uh, this other errors that can often error uh, that, that can happen in uh, in a real system. So these are what are called as systematic biases. So if we again take the example of the robot, uh, such a systematic bias, for example, can come say if you have a wheeled robot and the two wheels are not of the same size. So you fill in more air in one of them and less in the other one, or just due to the weight distribution on the robot, it ends up that your robot has a dominant direction. So it always turns left or it always turns right. So there is some systematic error which your kinematics or which your velocities do not capture. In that case, what would happen is that uh, although you would kind of, yeah, you wouldn't reach your desired uh, state, you would be kind of at a constant offset with the state. And this comes from this systematic bias. So calibration errors, errors in modeling, errors in uh, different kind of uh, assumptions that we make can happen that you uh, you think that you should have been in the, uh, you should have reached your desired state, but you end up at a constant offset or some offset away from your desired state. And this comes from these, uh, these kind of systematic uh, bias errors. And the way one usually solves for this is to come up with this ter third term, which here is in the middle, so the integral term here, uh, so we saw this part before and we add this new term, which is the integral term. What this guy says is basically uh, compute the differences between your desired state and the current state and add them up over all of the time. So what this would do in this, uh, in this uh, diagram here, it would add up all these, um, these, so the area between this two desired and the current state, and then use this to actually add to the, to the control. So if you have some of these errors, then you would still generate uh, some control. So even if your 
uh, even if there is no control coming from this part, you would still have some control coming from this part to actually keep the system to the desired state. So you could think of when, for example, in the, in the steady state case where, for example, you reach your desired position and you reach also with the desired velocity, but due to the systematic error at every instant, the tendency of the robot would be to get away because there is some error in there. And at that time, this term will come into play because as soon as you move away from your desired uh, uh, input, you would see, okay, I am accumulating some error because I'm not close to my desired place. And this would create some controls. So this way, we can reach our uh, we can reach the position using the proportional part. We can reach there with the correct velocity with the derivative part, and we can take care of the systematic biases uh, with the uh, with the integral part. Right. Again, here is shown uh, the same example for the systematic error. So the systematic error in this case, let's say, is this much. And what happens is you integrate the area under the curve from this because the equation what this essentially turns out to is nothing but from zero to t integrate the area under the curve and uh, this would mean that you would integrate this area under the curve here and uh, you would use this value to make to ensure that you push the system back to your uh, back to your uh, desired state even if there is some systematic error so same like what we saw before the only thing that we uh, need to be careful here, so it's quite good for steady state systems. So if you if you are close to your steady, uh, your desired position and then you have s some small uh, errors from this, it's quite good. But uh, it could be dangerous through what is called as the wind up effects. So one of this, uh, uh, one of the ways you could think of this is, let's say uh, you uh, you measure your system. So oh, let's say your, your state is evolving in a particular way but your measurement of this uh, state evolution is wrong. So a concrete example would be, let's say you have a robot which is stuck in a hole. Uh, you, you are giving it control, so the wheels are moving. And so your encoders are saying that the wheels are moving and you expect the system to be in some other place. However, in practice, in the real world, your state has not changed because you're stuck. So this means that there is a huge difference between where you think you are and uh, what you are, uh, what where you actually are, and this would mean that you would come up with a huge value for this, uh, for this uh, uh, integral term here, because you keep on adding this error. And then let's say at one moment you come out of the uh, of the hole, and you have a huge velocity, and this would jump, make the robot jump. So one way that people often um, uh, manage this is instead of integrating it over the entire time for which you run, you have a small window. So you say, okay, I'm able to correct my systematic errors by just considering the last five seconds of my, uh, of my path. So you could do, okay, I take these last five seconds and then I only compute this error over the last five seconds. So at least there is a, a upper limit on the amount of control you give due to this uh, due to this particular term. It won't be so high that you can end up in situations you don't want to. And there are other situations in which you can end up with wind up effects. For example, uh, you, you give a particular co uh, control, but the actuators are not able to reach this particular control. So there's a mismatch between the control that you ask the actuators to give versus what it's actually giving. And this can also result in uh, in, a, in a difference that accumulates over time and uh, results in the fact that you're not reaching your desired positions. So we'll see uh, an example uh, now. So uh, basically in this video, uh, we will see kind of an application or a demonstration of these three different terms, the P and the I and the D, in a very kind of classroom-like example where we attach uh, an indicator to a motor. So uh, as you see here, so the goal would be to bring this particular stick at the center of the uh, of the measurements here, right? So uh, what we will see is to first we see the proportional control with a proportional gain of 200, uh, and we see that we have a certain amount of overshoot. So instead of just stopping here, we go further uh, further than we expected. So this is because we are not using any derivative terms. So we are reaching the position, but we are reaching with some velocity and crossing over the thing. Again, if we see even with a higher, uh, a higher gain, we would see that, yeah, we are passing over, but we are also having more oscillations because the gain is even more higher. And so if we try even more higher gain, then we will see 
lots more oscillations. So just increasing the Kp more and more won't help. So now what we do is to add some derivative paths as well. So we have some uh, proportional paths and some derivative paths, so which make sure that we come more closely to the, uh, to the desired position. So here we are already quite close to our desired state, but we see that we still have some amount of uh, steady state error. So we now try with a proportional, uh, or sorry, an integral term as well to compensate for this, uh, for this, uh, for the, for this uh, st small steady state error uh, that we have. And uh, when we combine all of these three, uh, we would have expected this to work immediately, but we still have the problem coming from the wind up effect. So in this case, what's happening is the control that we are giving to the motor or we are asking of the motor is not being followed immediately. So we need to write something called as the anti wind up code, which basically limits the, the maximum movement that the motor can give. And when we have now all the three parts, the I, the P, the D and the I plus the anti wind up code, we end up in situations where we are able to come quite close to the center. Okay, so just to give you a quick summary, what we saw is a PID controller. So this consists of three parts, a proportional part, a derivative part, and an integral part. And you can uh, combine all these three gains, so to say, to develop a controller which will give the, uh, the performance that you desire. So if you want your uh, system to reach your goal fast, we use a higher KP. Whereas if you want to reach and make sure that there isn't too much oscillation over the or too much overshoot over the desired state then we also give some importance to the derivative part and similarly if we have some systematic bias in the system then we should use the integral term and uh, it's quite uh, 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 so it takes some effort to figure out these correct uh, uh, gains often this is done by trial and error methods but there are also some methods which actually tell you how to come up with reasonable uh, approximations or reasonable values for these uh, values right, for these gains. Okay, now we have seen two things, motor control at the lowest level, position control at the, let's say the mid level, and now we move on to the trajectory control where we would like to uh, now move our car, as you see here, along a particular trajectory. So we just don't want to go to a position and stop, but we want to actually move smoothly along a trajectory. So you can think of this also as an advanced position control in the sense that you just don't go to every point and stop, but rather you go to a point with a particular velocity and continue from there on. So in the end, what we would like to end up is having a control, so some use to this car, such that it's able to track this path smoothly. So how this path comes uh, depends on, let's say, your planning algorithm. So you have some uh, environment and then you, let's say, use the A star algorithm or some other algorithm to come up with a path uh, which will uh, which you want to follow. And now we'll only consider, we assume that we know this path and how should we actually generate the use to track this path. And often uh, you would see this following control architecture which is used in realistic uh, uh, situations. So I now show here uh, for a car like sit, uh, system, but in principle you can adapt it for any other kind of system. So a drone or a humanoid or so on. So at the topmost part exists the perception. So this means use your sensors to compute a map of the environment and then also perceive which are drivable areas, etc. Once you have this, then the next uh, thing is what is called as the motion planning, which would mean that you should come out with a path, so a path, path like this. And then when you want to track the trajectory, you don't just want, let's say, the x, y positions of the path. We also want to have a particular velocity for each uh, point on this path. So this would allow the fact that you don't stop and go every time, but you can move smoothly along your, uh, along your path. And this part is often called as motion planning. And this would be the input to our control thing, what we actually want to develop. And often uh, in, in, for, a, uh, for a car case, or in the case of an urban car, this control is broken into two parts, what is often called the longitudinal control and lateral control. So what this means, longitudinal means along the direction of motion. So this usually means you want to control the linear velocity of, the, uh, of your car, and this would be controlled by your longitudinal controller. Whereas the lateral controller will make sure that you are, are close to the path that you want to follow. So you're not too far away in terms of the distance perpendicular from it. So technically speaking, uh, these paths are not, or these two 
portions of the state are not isolated. So if you change your linear velocity a little bit, then it also affects the distance from the path uh, that you are. So the perpendicular distance from the path that you are. But in practice, to simplify the problem, uh, people usually uh, break your control problem into smaller, more, more, uh, more easy to develop controllers. So instead of having one controller which does both longitudinal and lateral corrections, we just break this up. Although this is a slightly uh, uh, less correct, so to say, because uh, controlling this might affect the lateral parameters which you are not taking into account and so on. But in practice, if you do this fast enough, so to say, then uh, this works out and this is how we will see uh, how, how we do it in this example. And then once you have this control, this basically goes to the actuation. So in our case, for the longitudinal control, we want to control the velocity. This means that we will either press the gas or press the, yeah, the acceleration or brake. So we can even either uh, put more power or less power. Whereas the actuation for the lateral one would be through your steering. So you move your steering in order to decrease your, let's say the distance away from your tracking. So this is a typical architecture that you would see for a autonomous car kind of system where you want to track a particular trajectory. So let's see the first step again. So the first step would be the trajectory generation. So this red uh, line would be the thing that would be given by your planning algorithm. And then once you have this red line, uh, there are multiple ways from which you could come out with a, a, a nice or a useful trajectory. So one, the simplest idea is you just sample uniformly on this trajectory, let's say every five meters, and you end up with something like this. It's good enough for many cases. Um, sometimes, say if you're moving at faster speeds, usually the troublesome areas are where you have large curvatures. So when you have large curvatures, you need to steer harder, so to say, and uh, it helps if you have more points or more points on the trajectory in places where the, 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 the control needs to be higher. And what one uses usually or very commonly is the curvature. So if you have a high curvature, you can sample more points in the place where there is high curvature in order to ensure a more smooth, um, smooth movement. And there are several uh, other ideas to do this, but these are the two basic ones uh, which often yield very good results for uh, for fairly, let's say, um, medium speed control. Right? The next thing to consider now is to consider the 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 kinematics that comes from the uh, from the uh, uh, from the car uh, um, restriction, so to say. So, for example, here we consider the Ackermann steering drive. So, we've seen in the in this lecture for mo locomotion basically how we derive these equations. So delta here is the steering angle, uh, which is the angle that you see here for the virtual wheel. And uh, the idea uh, that we have here is that we have one instantaneous center of rotation. So all the wheels that you have, so the left and the right, as well as this uh, virtual wheel that we have, must pass, pass through this one point. So the idea he here is that you have one point of rotation about which your whole car uh, rotates. And what this ensures is that all of your wheels are always rolling. So there is no skidding in your system. And this is something that we would want. So when the system is rolling, there's less friction with the ground, everything is moving freely, and we can also estimate, so to say, how our system is evolving quite well. And uh, we, we have seen these equations also before, and what we would want to make sure is that we, when we develop a controller, we want to ensure that these uh, criteria are met. So we want to make sure that our uh, our uh, steering is su in such a way that we have this instantaneous center of uh, rotation. So uh, uh, just to uh, give a small short summary, so basically in this case, we would have a state, which would be the x, y, and theta, so the uh, position and the orientation, as well as the steering angle. So in this case, we also want to control the steering angle. And our controls here would be this longitudinal and lateral control. In terms of the longitudinal control, this would be the forward velocity that we have for our vehicle. And in terms of the lateral control, this would be the rate at which we change the steering. So uh, this delta dot is the rate at which we move the steering. So these are the controls that we want. And we want to uh, generate such controls which obey this constraint. So we want the steering angle to be this tan inverse d by r, which will ensure that we have this one point of rotation to ensure smooth uh, movement. Right? Then 
we also have some restrictions on our control. There's only so fast our car can go. So we have a maximum velocity that we can give. So we, there's only so much pedal, uh, gas that we can give. And we have a, 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 a limit also on how much we can steer. So we can't steer infinitely. There's a maximum amount which we can steer. So all these, uh, con all these let's say, restrictions or constraints should be considered by the controller in order to generate a U, so uh, base, which means that a forward velocity and a steering rate, which lies within these valid regions and follows the kinematics, which will ensure smooth rolling. Right. So, like I said, we solve this control problem separately. We solve the longitudinal problem and we solve the lateral problem uh, uh, separately. So, in the longitudinal case, let's say we uh, our motion planning generates this particular trajectory, which means that over time we want to have these different velocity profiles. So this is quite similar to the PID control problem that we saw here. So we have a reference trajectory here and we have uh, some velocity that we want to give to our car. And so basically we can solve this problem exactly the same way we did using a PID controller. So uh, your V is your desired state and this V reference, oh sorry, the V is the state you want to control, the forward velocity, and V reference is the velocity which you want it to to move. Here, of course, the V reference is changing over time. Before the example we saw, it was constant, but it doesn't matter. So it's just that at each point, you have a particular reference, and this changes at each point. So the PID would always uh, compute the error, which is with respect to the current uh, reference point, and you can reach this uh, desired state. Technically, you can also do the same for your lateral control. So for example, if you say, this, uh, if, uh, if you think this red line is the path that you want to uh, want to traverse, you can say okay, and this is let's uh, this is a, a simplified version of the car that we saw here just to uh, just to make this uh, figure a bit simple. You can also always say okay, I compute my angle with respect to the current path. So let's say I take the nearest point on the path, I compute the angle with the uh, my, uh, the angle between my heading and the path tangent. And I could say, okay, I will develop a PID controller which will make sure that this error comes to zero. So I always go along the tangent of the path. This is a reasonable uh, controller. However, in practice, this gives no importance to the kinematics or the, or, the, or the restraints that we had before, the constraint that comes from uh, on the steering angle. So if we don't ensure that the steering angle has this constraint, this would mean that we would skid. And therefore, often in practice, what one does for lateral control is instead of just using a PID controller, you also want to use the kinematics or the constraints that, that you have for your vehicle. And in this case, uh, we come out with a law which looks like this, so which basically says set your uh, uh, steering angle as the tan inverse of this particular value here. And this way, what you would ensure is that you would move along a circular arc and move and intersect your uh, your desired path at a particular distance, also called as the look ahead distance LD. So this would not immediately try to enter your or get close to your uh, traje desired trajectory, but it would follow a smooth circular trajectory to do this. So we'll not go into how exactly we came out with this formula. So you could figure this out actually with a little bit of geometry. So actually treat this as an exercise and you would uh, to derive these equations and the hint would be you have to apply some kind of sign, uh, si the law of signs to get this from the geometric relationship. So anyways, the message is that uh, uh, you now, uh, by applying this formula, you, uh, you uh, uh, give some importance or you basically follow the, the uh, constraint that was obtained using this uh, ICC constraints that you have always rolling along some point. So this way you could do your lateral control, right? So we did the, the longitudinal control using a PID controller and the lateral controller uh, set in a way such that you obey the kinematics of the, of the robot. So let's actually now see a small video where we see this in action. So some students from MIT here actually implemented this on a small, uh, small sized, I don't know, an RC car. Uh, and what you see here is the map of the environment and the goal is to follow this white uh, path that you see here. Right? As you can see, it's not the most uh, smooth controller that you, that you have ever seen. As you see large oscillations, this means that they would need to do some more uh, uh, tuning of their P, uh, D and I uh, gains. 
However, overall you see that the, the, that the robot is moving quite fast and is able to track the position that you have. Again, here you have a, a longitudinal control uh, controlling the speed of the robot and the lateral control which is controlling, so to say, the distance from the, uh, from the actual path. Okay. With this, I would like to actually uh, talk uh, just about some, give just some information or introduce you to this term called as the cascaded control. So we saw these, the, these three different controls. We saw the motor control, we saw the position control and so the trajectory control. And in practice, what one does is you do, uh, you do each of these controls, but you do them at slightly different frequencies. And this both comes from the application point of view in the sense that for the motors, you need to control it many times per second to ensure it that it reaches the position that you want. So typically you control the motors, let's say a thousand hertz. So every, uh, yeah, thousand times every second, you ensure that your motor reaches your, uh, your desired velocity. And then you do a slightly lower uh, control on your position base. So you say 10 times every second, make sure that uh, you are updating the position control. Whereas on the top level, the trajectory control, maybe you do it only once every 10 seconds. So you compute a new trajectory every uh, every 10 seconds. So the trajectory you have, the reference trajectory you have is good enough for 10 seconds. So what this also ensures is that for the, uh, for the control layer, which is on top of the bottom one, it almost ensures as if there is no controller below it. You have a constant velocity. So if you think of here, since this guy is setting the uh, velocities for the motor thousand times a second, with respect to the position control, you can uh, assume that the velocity is being set quite constant for the time in which you are doing the position control. So this makes the assumption easier and also makes the overall scheme work. So the same at, as we go each layer above, we can safely assume that because of the high frequency of the control below, we would actually reach the state that we expect the system uh, to reach. Right. With this, uh, I would also like to kind of just say a couple of words about uh, the design goals. So we've seen the controller, a PID controller, and we have seen like we want uh, to not overshoot too much. So this would be something like accuracy. We want to be close to our tracking uh, signal. We don't want to go too far away from the signal. Then we also want the uh, controllers to be safe. So we don't want to, uh, to uh, generate some control that could cause some harm either to the robot itself or to the environment. So limit the maximum controls that are there. Then we would like ideally to have controllers which are robust to noise. Right? So even if there is noise in the, in the system predictions or in the measurements, we still want our control to be meaningful to drive to our desired uh, location. Then we want the controller to reach our desired location as fast as we want. And this is what is computed using usually the response time. And so all these are quite important goals and also something like maintenance. So in the sense that when you create new or when you create a controller, maybe over the years, different people actually manage these systems and it should be easy for them to, let's say, tune these uh, control parameters so that uh, they can, so that the uh, robot, for example, can be used over long periods of time or even to transfer them to a new system. So if a new robot comes up, your uh, uh, controller should also be easy to transfer to this new uh, robot itself. And there are several other application specific goals, but whenever you sit to design a controller, these are some of, let's say, the top five things that should come up to your mind. Okay, uh, how accurate is my thing? How safe is my controller? Is it robust enough to the noise that I expect to be? Uh, uh, how fast can I reach my desired state, etc. Okay, with these uh, different parameters in mind, we then go to the last portion of this lecture where we'll look at some of the advanced control techniques. So we'll not go really into deep into each one of them. I just want to give you a rough idea of what these control uh, techniques deal with. And um, I hope this encourages you to go and search in the literature how they work or where they can be useful and so on. So to start off with the, the top two that you see here, the optimal control and uh, quadratic linear controller are basically techniques which treat your uh, computation of control as an optimization problem. So they basically would come out with an objective function saying, okay, this is the objective that we want to reduce. So let's say the distance to the, to the desired state, the controls, etc., And they would come out with, uh, uh, they will solve this optimization problem. And the solution of the optimization problem would be the control that you would apply. And we'll see a little bit more about how these work. 
Then there's an entire range of techniques for robust control, which basically say, okay, I know that there are certain errors in my measurements. I know that there are certain errors in my system prediction and so on. How can I design a controller, which at least let's say, uh, given a particular magnitude of my error, uh, ensures that my control is still uh, correct or it can still drive my system to the required or the desired signal or the desired, yeah. And uh, then the uh, fourth one that we see here is what's called as an adaptive control. And what happens often is that as the system evolves, some of the system parameters itself might change. So the system changes over time. This means that your controller should adapt to, the, to these changes. And so there are techniques which also try to estimate the system parameters as you go over time in order to actually ensure that your controller is still up to date and can uh, can be used currently or at that instant. And then uh, there's a lot of uh, work also in what is called as the fail safe control, which means that in the worst case scenario, if something happens, can you still ensure that your system degrades smoothly rather than you know, crashing into the wall or falling off from the sky? Can you, can you um, design controllers which will ensure that even in the case, for example, I don't know an engine of the aircraft, for example, uh, is lost, you still have some control over the system. So can you ensure such systems? And finally, we'll also see a little bit about learning based control where we see, for example, multiple examples of how vehicles are being controlled or how drones are being controlled and use this as examples to figure out a new uh, control loss, so to say. And there are many more techniques to do control. These are uh, some that I would just show you a little bit about. So uh, as, I, as I told you before, optimum control basically poses your control problem as an optimization problem. And the way it does is to come out with a, an objective function to measure the performance. So you have some performance for your controller and you want to, uh, to measure this one. So usually the questions that one can ask in order to define such an objective would be, uh, what is a good performance? And this could be like, we want that controller which minimizes the error, so the distance to the desired signal. We want that controller which, for example, minimizes the amount of control. So you don't want to steer too much or you don't want to move your handle too much. So give me that control which minimizes this kind of movement. And you can have this in different combinations. So how much are you ready to give in terms of the error to the desired system versus uh, how much are you ready to use your control? So these are the different questions that you can ask. And uh, a particular uh, case of this uh, optimal control is what is called as the LQR or the linear quadratic regulator. And this gives you the optimal solution given certain conditions. So if your system is linear, like you see here, so if the system that you are trying to control has these properties and you construct, and you construct a quadratic loss function, which is shown as here, uh, then you can come out. So there's a closed form solution for the best uh, possible control that you would give to the system. So the way that you construct this uh, cost function is you have two parts. One part depends on the error vector. So this xk here actually represents the difference between your current state to the desired state. And you weight them using some matrix Q. So basically uh, you say, okay, the, uh, the error is so much important to me, or it's, I weight that importance using the Q. And I have also some error, so the objective function also depends on my control, right? And this is weighted through R. What one can do is by varying this Q and R, you can also weigh relatively, do you want to be really close to the desired signal or you want to make sure that you don't apply too many controls. So do you want to be resource efficient or you want to be accurate? So you can basically uh, do this kind of weighting using these Q and Rs and you can also uh, also control to the level of parts of the systems. For example, here, let's say you have a 2D robot and you have X, Y, and theta. By choosing the Q such that uh, you have high weights for the position and lower weight for the orientation, you can also make your controller give a control law which gives more importance or which makes sure that you reach to your position with a lot more importance than the orientation. So you get all these kinds of different tweaks that you often want in your real system. And the nice part is that if you have a system which moves like this, the solution is closed form and is the optimal one. So there is no better solution than this. 
but you know often in the real case this is not the case so most of the systems that you would like to control would be nonlinear and especially the case with vehicles drones etc these are very nonlinear systems and one way like we saw in many of the other lectures we deal uh, with this using linearization so we take our nonlinear system and if we can convert it into this linear system then we can apply again this LQR idea to get the optimal control. Of course here it's an approximation so the, the actual solution is not the most optimal one but it works quite well if the linearizations are, or the nonlinearities are small. Uh, this another way which is often uh, used in practice is what's called as this MPC controller. So this MPC controller also stands for model predictive controller and what you do here is that you keep the nonlinearities as it is and instead of solving these equations for the entire or the complete optimal problems you take a small window say a window of five seconds and for this five seconds through your computations through making many computations you can actually uh, compute the minimum of this nonlinear function as well. So the, fa the reason you are able to do this is only because you have a small window there are only so many possibilities that you can have and given today's quite fast computing or computers so to say we're actually able to numerically find the uh, the minima in this short uh, window and actually there's a really nice example where this MPC controller has been used for controlling this car which is making really a uh, very uh, dynamic movement so it will make really fast circles around this stuff and then try to make a eight shaped Thing. So as you can see this is a very non-linear motion, it's definitely not rolling so you can see a lot of skidding in there. So typically to control such systems it's really difficult to write the dynamics. However if you, if you take in this non-linear approach then you're able to do uh, uh, controls like this which are really difficult uh, to automate. Even for a person this would be really difficult and to come out with methods which actually are able to, uh, to do such control is really cool. Yeah. Okay, so that was a really nice example to see how to use nonlinear control to actually make really cool movements. And the next topic we have here is the adaptive control. Here the main idea is that the system can change over time and you would like to estimate these changes in addition to just computing a control law. And a classical example here is the case of an airplane. So as the airplane f flies, it consumes more fuel and this means that the weight of the airplane itself is changing. This then would mean that the dynamics of the, uh, the airplane is changing. So if the weight is lighter, the way it moves in the air is different than from when it's heavier and so on. And uh, adaptive control methods are those which actually try to uh, also estimate these changes or at least adapt their control to these changes uh, that are happening. So here I don't mention any particular approach but uh, the idea is to, um, to, to take into account that you will have some system parameters which might be changing over time or which are uncertain over time. Right? The next idea that we see here is of robust control. So here the thing is in most real situations we have an idea that okay there will be noise but we also have an, have an idea of okay this is the maximum noise that I, uh, that I expect for this particular application. So I know I'm giving some velocity to my car. I say okay the velocity I give is maybe plus or minus 10% to the one that I give and so on. So if we have this knowledge of the noise then can we use this in order to come out with some uh, some controls which despite this noise are able to give some guarantees on the performance. So it says okay I guarantee that if my noise on the sensors is less than this threshold then the error that I will give has certain uh, properties. So it won't be more than let's say two meters or something like this. So there are some techniques which actually provide these guarantees in the presence of, uh, of noise. Right? Uh, the, the distinguish, uh, the, the, let's say the, the difference from the adaptive thing is usually in the robust control you don't really consider the adaptive nature of, those, of the parameters of the system itself but more to deal with the noise. So, as, I mean you could use both robust and adaptive systems for the same uh, uh, same kind of control problem but it's just what kind of makes it different from the adaptive one. And finally uh, we see uh, some learning based uh, uh, approaches. So this is the system that we have been trying or this is the, uh, the, the graph that we have which we are trying to control. So we're trying to uh, control the system and we measure something from the system and compute the controllers based on the error signals like we saw before. right? 
and usually we need some kind of model for our system to predict how the model uh, is going to happen and often for cases such as the one let's say the car drifting in the in the parking lot we saw we actually to model the dynamics of such systems is really difficult and oh, what the idea with the learning based control is that instead of actually modeling the dynamics can we just look at many of such examples that um, that we can find let's say i know we put a camera in front of a car and watch these uh, cars skidding can we actually just use these examples to learn something about the uh, about how the system itself is so you could do learning at the system level to find out how the system is evolving or you could also learn something at the controller level in the sense that okay you watch a human operator doing 100 Uh, demonstrations and then given these demonstrations can i come out with a control law so this is what usually the learning based approaches uh, tend to do so we'll see an example here for actually a quadcopter where it has uh, basically some markers on top of it through which it can figure out how it has actually moved so in this case it wants to move go around this trajectory however the controller gives some trajectory which is not that good then because it can or because it knows or it gets this feedback of the trajectory it followed before it uses this feedback to improve its controller and over time we will see that it gets more closer and closer to the desired uh, desired trajectory so it takes its previous performance or previous into uh, into account and then adapts its parameters in order to come out with something that's uh, that's better so similarly here see a bit more complex trajectory with an s where it learns this over time it's a nice example where uh, where basically uh, some external disturbance is being had so we switch on the fan here uh, and the uh, initially the uh, quadcopter doesn't know about this thing but by observing its motion it's able to figure out okay there seems to be some external force and i need to compensate for such forces so learning with demonstrations is one of the ways to uh, to do it or learning with seeing in this case it's learning from your past experiences itself and another way where one could uh, infuse this learning into the controller is from simulations so in this case this car would make a, a quite a difficult maneuver so it will try to parallel park while it's moving back so it will try to parallel park in here and this is something usually really difficult to model in terms of its dynamics so what uh, they did is here is to Uh, to basically simulate this uh, kind of parking in a simulator and then they then also use some uh, physics based system so they for the for the for the uh, for the region where you go straight the dynamics is easy so you can use the physics but then they combine it with this kind of uh, examples coming from simulation to do the more complex uh, uh, task of let's say parallel parking while going backwards Right. So now we see the same thing actually running on the real robot, where we now see that this robot is coming backwards and make this really cool turn. So what has happened here is that we've used both the knowledge from the physics simulator, but as well as some demonstrations from some examples that were given previously, in order to achieve this rather difficult task. Uh, here we'll see a really interesting example of fail-safe control. So what you would see here is that as the robot flies up. one of the propellers is made to come out and the idea is that even when the propeller uh, comes out we should not just fall from the sky but rather have a more degraded performance so or rather degrade smoothly so what you would see here is that it recognizes that one of the uh, wings has broken and then smoothly comes down rather than falling down from the sky as if uh, uh, it it didn't have this knowledge so these kind of control laws are also or control techniques are called as fail safe controls where you would still want to give some kind of minimum performance even if you uh, have some kind of catastrophic uh, failure in your system okay with this i reached the final slide of the summary of our lecture so we have seen uh, the low level control and how motors work at the beginning then we have seen how to use the feedback control let's say in the example of a shower but also to see to understand this idea Uh, of how to use the measurements from the sensor to drive the system to the uh, to the place that we want or to the desired signal and we have seen the idea of a pid controller and how we can use this to uh, to do position controlling and we have seen an example where we 
uh, we come out with a scheme in order to uh, to make our robot follow a particular path, which is the common task in, let's say, autonomous navigation. And finally, we just saw very uh, broadly some of the advanced control methods which are used uh, uh, for obtaining more uh, more performance say, or better performance in cases where we have noise or we have uh, adapting or we have changing parameters, etc. And we have seen, let's say, how we can use learning or previous ex uh, previous experiences to actually also learn some controllers. So here I would like to acknowledge these sources. So some of these materials has been from these different sources. And uh, if you're interested, I would also recommend you to go through them uh, to, to have a different explanation or also to see into different topics uh, what they cover there. And with that, I thank you for your attention.